The collaboration started out as, a, as an idea, as many projects, writing projects do, and um, I had the notion to write a group of poems to honor the prairie. And um, I was thinking about the project and I was also thinking how fun it would be to have pictures with it. Like, so I uh, coerced him into uh, <laughs> supplying some <laughs> pictures and uh, drawings. And um, I asked him actually if he had any drawings and he said, oh, Yes, I have like over a thousand drawings. <laughs> and I was pretty sure he had some drawings that were, had something to do with the prairie. So um, that's where I asked him to help out. And I wrote the poems first, actually, and then he put his drawings yeah. with the poems. Um, so. I've known Twyla for a long time and know her, and knew her poetry, but uh, this sort of came out of the blue. As I remember, she showed up in the office one day and said she needed some <laughs> drawings. And uh, so I looked at the poems, and there are about 25, 26 of them, mm -hmm. I think. And I mentally figured, yes, I can cover that and that and that and that. And uh, about the only poems that I didn't already have drawings for involved things like some insects, butterfly, cicada, firefly, and some general plant drawings. Uh, but basically, I only had to do about five or six new drawings, and uh, so it was pretty easy, actually. It was kind of fun, because I've never drawn a firefly before or a cicada, and so it was interesting to try that. It really was a collaboration, um, and it was kind of a give-and-take kind of thing, because I actually, when I said I wrote the poems first, I meant that I wrote a few, I think I'd written maybe ten, and I sent them to him, and he said, oh yeah, and he was thinking of drawings to put with the poems. And then I thought, well, I've got to have more than that. So I wrote a few more, and it took a three month, over a three month period, I think. I wrote the poems, would send him groups of poems, and, and said, oh, we've got to have grasses, and we've got to have a monarch, and we have to have, yeah. um, what was the other cicada you said, a yeah. lightning bug. Yeah, and, and a skull of um, a of a, a bison and a few other weird things. Um, but I, uh, I didn't spend three months out. I probably spent two or three days yeah. <laughs> at most. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but it was a fun, it was a give and take. Yeah, just let yeah. and I, I think I only redid one. I wasn't very happy with, well, first I did the firefly during the daylight. That wasn't any good, so I, <laughs> I had to change it to a night scene. Yeah, that's a fun uh, And a fun then I uh, modified the bison drawing a bit. The book's titled Prairie Sweet, a Celebration. And it was actually published by Spring Creek Prairie uh, Audubon Center near Den Denton, Nebraska. Um, it took a, well, it took a bit to get it published, but yeah. they had a donor, a very generous donor. Um, and um, it's now a benefit. They sell it at their gift shop. Mm -hmm. So all the money from the book goes to Spring Creek Prairie for their education programs, which is kind of nice. And we really don't know how many have sold yet, frankly. It's not a secret, but I guess we haven't <laughs> asked. <laughs> you and I have sold, yeah. I suppose, a few dozen. Yeah. Maybe you more than I. <laughs> right. They, they keep selling, and you know they have them there in the gift shop out at yeah. Spring Creek Prairie, yeah. which is kind of nice. And it was my first uh, entry into really illustrating a book that I hadn't written. All of the, my other drawings have been done for books of mine, so that was kind of new. Yeah. I'm only working on one book. Well, I'm revising my book on the Platte, which came out in the 80s and desperately needed revision. Uh, and I, over the last two or three years, I've been working on a book which is really a history of the Lakota Dakotas, uh, of the Pine Ridge. I'm part Native American myself, but a very small part. But I've been interested in not only the history of Native Americans, but their mythology, their belief systems, their uh, uh, folklore. And a lot of that has gotten into earlier books of mine. But uh, this was an effort to deal just with the, basically the group around Wounded Knee and, of course, bring in the, the Wounded Knee story. 
and uh, uh, all of the other things since about 1850 up until 2007 that have happened to that that rather unfortunate tribe. It's just it's basically been downhill ever since 1850. So it's a sad. A sad story, uh, but one I thought should be uh, uh, written. Not many people really know the details. Well, I don't have any <coughs> collaborations um, in the works. <laughs> um, I actually working full time, so it's a little tough to get started uh, even on some writing projects. But um, I suppose if we did another one, it would have to be for children. That would be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, they sell way better than adult books, I've discovered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so the, my book on, the book that Karen and I, my daughter Karen and I did on dragons and unicorns, probably has sold ten times better than <clears throat> anything else I've ever done. And still in print nearly 25 years later. So that's the market. There we go. <laughs> There's a lot of things I want to write. I, I scribble notes when I have ideas for writing. It's a little tough to find the time right now. Um, you know, that's always the dilemma, I think, of writers. You have way more to write about than you, you have time to figure out when you're going to do it. But I'll get back to it. I'm sure I will. So, <laughs> Writing for me is a little bit different, I guess. I, I really am kind of a compulsive writer. I'll, I'll let everything else go. <laughs> yeah. Do the writing. Worry about work and things like that <laughs> later. Things like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you do your writing in my spare time. I, I do other things in my spare time. I see. <laughs> yeah, and I think um, that might be a basic difference between prose and poetry. I yeah. mean, I think I'm going out of limb here because I can only speak for myself. But um, poetry actually takes some white space. I don't know how to explain it other than that. You have to clear out some time and not really have a zillion things going uh, in order to write. And yeah. um, that hasn't been too plentiful for me lately, but um, yeah. I know how the process works. And it is a process, but the creative moment when you can scribble down that little kernel of idea, that's what really counts. And then the work can come later, but um, getting those ideas takes a certain amount of white space, yeah. I think. It, it's totally different. I, I normally can write about 2,000 words a day. You wow. probably <laughs> get 20 or so, maybe 100. <laughs> wow. <laughs> anyway, so it's, it's just sort of eight hours of serious thinking and typing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's all I can say. 50 books in about 50 years, um, and I never imagined anything like that would happen. It, in college, I thought, maybe if I'm lucky, I'll write a book. You know, I thought that would be my contribution <laughs> to science or whatever. And uh, that idea continued uh, through graduate school. Then luckily, I had a postdoc in England, two-year postdoc which gave me a lot of time to look at birds and a lot of time to write. So I started writing two books, thinking with luck maybe one of them will get published. Uh, and the more serious one is the one that I submitted for publication, Cornell. And it got published. Then after it was published and I decided, well, that's it. I'm not going to bother to publish the other one. Uh, the then director of the University of Nebraska Press, Bruce Nickel, who I knew somewhat came around and said, well, you've done one book for Cornell, now you've got to do one for, for us. And I said, well, I, I'm not writing. I said, I've got a book in my files, but it's no good. <laughs> he said, what do you mean, no good? I said, well, I just don't think it's very good. He said, that's my job. I, and so he followed me to my office, took it home with him. And the next day he said, yeah, we've got to publish that. And uh, that was Waterfowl, Their Biology and Natural History, which went through many printings, so it was better than I thought. And I decided, well, this is easy. You know, if I can write prize-winning books that I think are not particularly good, <laughs> I might as well continue. <laughs> well, at this point, I guess I'm mostly a writer. I mean, uh, uh, that's a little hard. Most of what I write is about biology, virtually all of it. Uh, but, but, you know, when people ask me what I do, I say I'm a writer. 
also, though you are, you know, trained as a, a biologist and yeah. have taught, yeah. and also um, have written world monographs. <laughs> About eight or wanna, ten of them. You want to talk about those <laughs> and what's involved in a world monograph? Well, a world monograph means taking a group of birds, usually a family, anywhere from about a dozen to three or four hundred species, and deciding to summarize basically almost everything that's known about them. And that, that involves a lot of library work, a lot of reading. And so most of it is, is if you will, accumulating what's already known in the literature, supplemented by whatever field work I can do uh, and uh, and then hoping to find a publisher because these things don't sell very well frankly mm. uh, so uh, so yeah that th those are my major contributions I think uh, those are the books I hope will be around 20 30 40 years later okay so I've always loved the prairie ever since I learned about prairie um, I was going to say something about that because I didn't grow up knowing about prairie. I grew up in farmland, which is all plowed. And um, the only natural places were like the, the field margins and the ditches and stuff. But um, I first came to know about prairie plants as in my training in horticulture at the University of Nebraska. And um, actually my um, landscape plants class instructor, um, Richard Sutton, you might know him. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he had told us how to use native plants in a landscape. And I thought, this is pretty mm -hmm. far out. And then the next job I had was at the University of Nebraska Landscape Services. And um, for some reason, I got to go out to Nine Mile Prairie when the university um, first got the land. Acquired it, yeah. Acquired it. And um, anyway, he led a small group of us from the Landscape Services out there, and I just fell in love with it. I had never had any notion that there was places like this. And that's, that's a small prairie, as it turns out. And, and Spring Creek Prairie is, you know, at least three times that size. And yeah. um, it's very unique in other ways. They're both unique because they've never been plowed. Actually, mm -hmm. that's not technically true. Part of Nine Mile Prairie has yeah. been plowed. Yeah. But it's coming back, you know, that portion that was mm -hmm. plowed. But um, Spring Creek Prairie is unusual because it, it was preserved and um, somehow, luckily, with cattle and horses and rocks and things, and so they couldn't plow it. It's hilly. Yeah. So it's still yeah. there. It's we preserved. Have, we have the it's last amazing. glacier to thank for that, leaving all those rocks in that yeah. moraine. Uh, and all these hills that were produced. Yeah, that's uh, what I figure is the difference between here and um, Kansas. Like the, the Flint Hills are tall grass prairie, and they've never been plowed. But they have all these rocks down there, you know? <laughs> they can't plow it. <laughs> so it's, it's grazing land, and that's the difference, I think. That it's, mm. That's why it's been preserved. Yeah. But, yeah. I grew up not quite in tall grass prairie, but my mother was raised uh, on a homesteaded piece of land which is now part of Cheyenne National Grasslands. It's the biggest remaining tall grass prairie in North Dakota. So she grew up on a farm and taught me many of the prairie plants when I was a kid. And so I've always loved prairie and, and so grasslands have been my special interest. I, I've mainly lived in and around grasslands and so the sand hills and prairie, and short grass prairie, Palouse prairie, a variety of grasslands that I've come to love. So this was easy. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I thought it was an easy thing for me to take on. Good evening. <clears throat> Thanks for coming this evening. My name is Meredith McGowan, and I am the curator of the Heritage Room. And I'd like to welcome you to the Heritage Room and to the John H. Ames Reading Series. Um, it's a series that's been in existence for more than 20 years, so we're pretty excited about that. And in fact, tonight we are hosting the 170th reading. So you're here to be a part of that, so that's great. Um, we are here in the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors. It is a special collection. It's a re representative collection that d is dedicated to promoting and preserving works by and about Nebraska authors. Um, about 13,000 volumes now in this room, 
and uh, 3,000 authors, more or less, and a number of other things too. You can see pictures on the walls and carvings of birds that, that people have made and other uh, memorabilia too from Nebraska authors. So um, it's a great place to visit. Uh, we'd be glad to have you come back anytime when we're open. Um, kind of limited hours, but 12 to 3, Tuesday through Friday, and Sunday afternoons from 2 to 5. Um, there is an author that I thought I should mention tonight, um, Lauren Isley, has a number of books found in this room. Um, he died in 1977, so this is actually the, um, the 30th anniversary of his death. It's also the 100th anniversary of his birth. He was born in 1907, and you can see behind me the centennial display of works um, and pictures of Lauren Isley, so that might be something you'd want to take a look at, too. Um, we also would like to thank the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association because we're able to bring special programs to you um, because of their work establishing an endowment a number of years ago. So thanks to them. Tonight our readers are Twyla Hansen and Paul Johnsgaard. Twyla's interests seem to lie in the area of horticulture and agriculture. I believe she's a grounds manager and arboretum curator at Nebraska Wesleyan. I hope I got that right. And she also likes to write. <laughs> she used to be. She isn't now. <laughs> she has a different job now. <laughs> anyway, I know she does work, but she also writes in her spare time. And she's written a number of poetry books and has won some awards, including the Nebraska Book Award Competition for Poetry in 2004. Paul's interests seem to lie in the areas of biology, wildlife, and specifically ornithology. He was at UNL for a number of years in, I think it has changed names over the years, but Department of Zoology, and then the School of Biological Sciences. So we've changed um, names over the years since 1961. And in 2001, he became a Foundation Regents Professor Emeritus. So he's been retired for a few years. And he does like to write, too, and you probably know that. Um, he's written, and these are his words, 50 books, 100-plus papers, 50-plus popular writings, essays, etc. And then he said, see attached list. And I do have the list if you, want, if you want to see that later. I'd be glad to show that to you. But to keep him humble, we do have a display case in the back of the Heritage Room here. And we have... Um, uh, kind of a manuscript to finished book sort of a d display back there. And we do have some things that Paul gave us earlier. There is actually a letter from a publisher that says something to the effect, although this does not fit with our current publishing plans, we appreciate your thinking of us. Your material is returned herewith. So even the great writers who've written 50 books have their, have their work returned to them sometimes. Anyway, it was, the book was published again by, an, uh, or soon after that, by another publisher. And that book was called Those of the Gray Wind. So it is back there as you leave. You might want to take a look in the display case there to see that. Um, although the, among their, I'm sorry, among their many literary accomplishments, Paul and Twyla have recently collabora collaborated on a collection of prairie poems and drawings entitled Prairie Sweet, A Celebration. And the book was written to support and celebrate the Spring Creek Prairie Audubon Center. And so they do sell that, I think, and all of the proceeds go to that prairie. We are very excited to have Paul and Twyla here with us. If you could help me welcome them, that would be great. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, I'm Twyla Hansen, and this is Paul Johnsgaard. And this is going to be a slightly different kind of reading. Um, I should maybe explain the background of what, what happened here. Um, a few years ago, I got the notion of, well, I've always written about the prairie. OK. Then I thought it would be nice to do something for Spring Creek Prairie, because I just fell in love with that place when I first went out there. And I've been going out there ever since. And um, I thought it would be fun to have a small collection of poems and just give them to the prairie and see what, what would happen. And they could use it or something. But I thought it would be even better 
if there were some drawings with the poems. So it really kind of guided how I wrote these poems. And Paul, I enlisted his help. I said, do you have any drawings? And he said, yeah, I have like a thousand drawings. <laughs> so that wasn't the problem. Um, <laughs> that, and that worked out really well. He was very gracious about my idea and worked uh, wonderfully with me. And um, I wrote the poems. And I, f I thought of the poem, their short poems, and the drawing as one unit. So um, on the page, um, when you open it up, there is a drawing and a poem, and they p appear together. And so that was my notion on that. Maybe Paul could explain what he thought of this whole thing. You need to talk in here. Yeah. Yes, luckily, I, nobody wants to buy my drawings, so I collect them, basically. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I have something like a 1,000 representing these 50-odd books. And uh, I never really had drawn for someone else's book. And so this was kind of a new idea, and uh, of the titles and ideas that uh, the Twyla had, I figured I could cover nearly all of them with uh, with my files. I've written about prairies and sand hills and and other sorts of grasslands and the animals and and associated plants. So I figured it would be easy. Uh, I didn't count on a bunch of poems about bugs. <laughs> so I, I had to uh, come up with some uh, insect drawings that I'd never done, but that was kind of fun. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, uh, drawing an insect is, I suppose, like drawing anything new. You have to start counting legs and counting leg segments and antennae segments, and, mm -hmm. and uh, so it, it's not easy. And I'm not sure they're great drawings, but at least they were challenging to do and, and fun to do. So, uh, so basically, I had to do about six or seven essentially new drawings, but, but uh, that didn't take long, not nearly as long as it took her to, to write the poems, I think. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything else? Uh, their drawings are all uh, pen and ink, uh, as they have been for the, for the last 50 years. I've, I've never gone much beyond pen and ink drawings. Most of them were initially large. I usually draw about three times the size of whatever of the final product will be. And um, uh, so that's, that's basically all they amount to. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It, um, okay. So he said it didn't take him long to draw those drawings, but, you know, 50 years of drawing. <laughs> it took me about three months to write these poems. It's a short um, collection. And um, we worked back and forth. It was a lot of fun. Um, I would draw, or I would write some poems, and I'd send them off to him, and he he was figuring out what what drawing would look good with it or would work. And and then of course I said, well, I want to write a lightning bug poem, and so he drew a lightning bug, and we'll get to that. That's a cute story. And so anyway, I thought, and this is a little bit different reading tonight, so um, bear with us because we're going to have to kind of switch back and forth and um, the poems are short so um, and luckily and I have the drawings and everything on the CD so you'll have something to look at when I'm reading. Um, so I would just like to um, start with the first poem in the book and so when that comes up um, the first um, picture will be the poem, and it's called Evolution. That's what the poem looks like, but when I read the poem, I want you to put the drawing up is the next one with it. So we've got three things going on here. We've got two people in the, that. So you, if you put it to the drawing, which is the next one, okay. The poem is called Evolution. There doesn't have to be a reason. Some grains are taken on faith or chance. Yet each migrant has a story to tell each gleaming bone is an argument. Know this, when the last glacier caught whiff of the promise ahead, it raced backward on the pulse of wind, left pockets of fireweed and green song, surprising gifts of the erratic. Sun, wind, rain, drought, fire. Travel this frayed land where tall grass rules. Learn the buckle of deep time. Flora and fauna, sky and soil. Let them blaze the mind. 
Um, okay. May I say something about oh, it? <laughs> please do. Um, yeah, I wanted, I, that was a poem where I could have drawn quite a number of things, but I wanted to bring in the idea of, of deep time, as, as uh, Twilight said. And so I thought a fossil bison might be nice, and I, I didn't have access to bison antiquus, which is the species of bison that came before the modern one. Uh, but uh, I was able to borrow a skull of a bison from Spring Creek. I actually hauled it all over the northern plains. I wanted to photograph it in a variety of prairies in North Dakota west to Montana. So I <laughs> was quite familiar with that skull. And uh, so I decided to draw it and modify it slightly so it looked a bit more like Antiguus, the bigger and, and wider headed species. And uh, I put it in uh, a more uh, desert-like environment than Spring Creek is today. There's some Opuntia prickly pear cactus growing and such. But I figured that over the, we know that over the course of time there have been long extended periods of droughts that no doubt affected our prairies. And so I decided it would be interesting to have some uh, Opuntia cactus. And really bison skulls and cactus kind of go together anyway. So we <laughs> don't we have go. any Opuntia out at Spring Creek now, but nonetheless we probably once did. Yeah. Uh, and mentioning uh, glaciers, the, the reason, probably the only reason we have prairies like Spring Creek and uh, Nine Mile Prairie, which is the classic prairie nine miles northwest of the center of Lincoln, is because those prairies lie along the edge of a glacial moraine, which pushed up the land and left a lot of big rocks, boulders, some of them 10, 15 feet across making them not very suitable for uh, normal farming. And so those areas were basically uh, avoided or were simply not plowed until uh, fairly recently. And in fact, Spring Creek has never been plowed and a good part of Nine Mile uh, hasn't been plowed either. So that's the, the logic of that drawing. Okay, thank you. Okay, next. It's called Coyote. Um, whoops. I think I'll read that one too. Um, coyote. So um, basically there's a mixture of there's mammals and insects and um, plants and birds. birds. <laughs> Lots of birds. <laughs> Go figure. Um, okay, anyway, this one's called Coyote. Cold rhymes the pond's edge, exhales sharp and blue from hill to valley. Coyote, under fierce star's eyes, follows a small scent flaring from tall grass shadows, its hunger reflected overhead to the sharp and restless moon. Have you ever known such purpose, felt the true hammer of blood through your veins? Near the wallow stone, coyote, lean coyote tilts his head, twitches its ear. Prey hunkers down as soft bones and fur. Endless prairie roots go on breathing. Um, a word or two about coyotes. Uh, in the early days, and I'm thinking now of Lewis and Clark's time, coyotes were relatively rare because wolves ruled the roost. They followed the bison, and uh, coyotes are much smaller than wolves, and coy coyotes will be attacked and killed by wolves whenever they get a chance. And so, actually, Lewis and Clark first described the coyote, uh, although they just called it a small wolf. They didn't fully realize it was another species, uh, based on uh, some animals they saw in Montana. But as the wolves disappeared in the 1870s, 1880s, they disappeared along with the bison, and coyotes gradually replaced them. And so they've come to be our sort of large uh, mammalian predator of the prairie. Uh, they're doing reasonably well uh, now, and in fact, over the years, they've come to be, in some cases, almost semi-town animals. They've learned that they're safer in town than in the country. And so coyotes and also red foxes have gradually adjusted to uh, life, not only on the prairie, but sort of in the suburbs. Hmm. All right. <clears throat> Next one is called Earth. <clears throat> We're not going to get all the way through this book, so don't worry. <laughs> we'll just give you a taste of the book here, which I do want to say I did bring copies. 
in case you would like to donate $15 to Spring Creek Prairie, and we would probably be willing to sign in. So, all right, this is called Earth. Below ground is all where all can happen, anchor and breakdown and bedrock, processes of gritty explosion and darkened decay, the constant of winter and the blessing of rain. Plate and particle, the even temperatures, and absence of human memory. Is it necessary we understand? Could we simply stand on this umbrella of grass, inhale the sprawl of green dust, gasp at its flattened possibilities beneath its damp, matted underside? Here's to the unseen, the rooted, that unopened envelope yet to discover. The drawing is of a, um, of a hibernated, uh, hibernating harvest mouse, and it makes a perfect circle, or nearly so. That way the animal is able to retain the maximum amount of heat by just curling up literally into a ball. Uh, again, I drew that drawing for a different book, uh, but it seemed to fit here. They, they get down below ground in little holes, of course, and, and hibernate. So it, it seemed to me that it w would work for that purpose. Mm -hmm. It's cute. They, um, Spring Creek Prairie put that on a uh, t-shirt for kids. Yeah, they, love, they love it. Okay, do you want to scroll to the next one? Might as well get an amphibian in here. Yeah. Right? Okay. This one's called um, Frog Pond, and you saw what the poem looked like before it was slipped. Um, Frog Pond. Over the low, slippery, just thawed silt come the first spring ripples, gurgling, drifting over edges of black reed wands, spent tassels of cattails. From beneath logs, rocks, leaf litter, we undescend open our eyes, open our lids to intensified rays. Then a shining broth, a scampering soup, the pond alive with our chorus, critical indicators, our permeable skins susceptible to the smallest downward ladder, creatures whose lives both provide and partake. We sing our racket of approval in warming love of rain. The drawing is a western chorus frog, a tiny little frog, oh, I suppose about like that. The time I drew it, I knew the lily pad was probably too small for the frog, but <laughs> if I made the lily pad as big as it should have been, then the frog would have been too small <laughs> to fit the page well, so I took some artistic license when I did that drawing. <laughs> this is one of the new drawings that he did for this book. Okay, now we're going to skip, but um, skip to uh, Prairie Chicken. You can comment on any of these. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to read these poems, but okay, Prairie so Chicken. You're you going to read Prairie Chicken? Um, oh, you want me to? Sure. Well. I'll read Prairie Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Prairie Chicken. You can keep your theories. We have stocked it nearly to extinction. Yet out here in spring, on rolling hills of virgin prairie, it makes its legendary ground nest. This, this is wildness, silence, the crown fire center for its courtship battle called a lek. The male in feather fan and moan and air sac inflation. Oh, to possess such trembling strength, such purpose, passed down through the millennia. Glimpse this royalty, its sacred ceremony, the blended barred spirit feather of this otherwise quiet yet diminishing bird. Uh, I wanted you to read that because prairie chickens are sort of, I guess, my, the bird I maybe more identify with than almost any other in Nebraska. It, it's a bird of the tall grass prairie. It's declining rapidly. It's uh, been eliminated from 13 or 14 states and all the Canadian provinces. And yet it's the most magnificent bird I can think of. Uh, it's what I've visited and watched prairie chickens every spring since 1961 on a hilltop down near Burchard Lake. And it's, it's sort of my substitute for a real religion, I guess, because when you are watching and listening to prairie chicken during a sunrise, you really are, I think, 
moved into a spiritual world, and so I've, I've written a lot about prairie chickens, and if I read something later on, it might well be something about uh, watching prairie chickens in the spring. They're a simply wonderful bird. Hmm. Good. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, now the next one. I will not read this poem. This is called a lark sparrow, and there's a lark sparrow. The next one is sickle moon, and he d had a drawing of a luna moth. The luna moth, of course, is named for the moon, and so I thought that would be appropriate. Okay. Okay, meadow lark. I thought I'd read this one. That's our state bird. Meadow lark. Could there be a sweeter escape? Overcast dune sky, traversing the tall grass geography, rounding a bend to hear the bright meadowlark, its song pulse melodic and clear. From the nearest post, its flute notes perpendicular. So common, its common name mirrors the common. A bird of the meadow, song like larks of Europe. Yet somehow, its sum is greater. Rifling into grass, into thatch, extracting insects, the stately bird manifold in purpose, unlike us on a day in transition, as we risk the uncommon, our escape green and sweet. Of course, the middle lark isn't really a lark. It uh, belongs to the blackbird family, but uh, like a lot of common names, uh, it uh, simply has been adopted. Uh, by probably originally the English. Uh, we have two meadow larks here. We have the eastern meadow lark and the western meadow lark. And in Spring Creek, you could hear either one. They, uh, the eastern meadow lark tends to be closer to the water, the ponds. The western meadow lark tends to uh, have its territories on the higher hills. And so you, oftentimes both species are within hearing range. They don't hybridize. They're almost identical in appearance. They have very different songs, and that probably mm. keeps them apart. Mm. All right. <clears throat> Next, we'll skip the snake, although that's a fun drawing. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and we'll go to the dragonfly, which I asked him to draw a dragonfly because I love dragonflies. And I grimaced, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he said, oh. I have to draw one of those, and I have to get it just right because the entomologists will know. Not every vein. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of veins. So anyway, this one is in the voice of the dragonfly. Call me tiger. All day I command the heated air, work my bright wings above the pond, the wetland, hover, flit, zoom to grab mosquitoes on the wing. With complicated eyes, I quicken to heat and blossom, to the beckon of reed and cattail. Summer is my season, when grasshopper and cricket sing to the sun, when cicada lulls us into another hot night. Here, I've work to do. Touch me, if you dare. Dragonflies are about as much like birds as any insect. They have enormous eyes, they have color vision, and so the kinds of patterns they have, their wing patterns, their, the color of their body, even the color of their eyes, varies a lot between species, and our, these differences are important in what is called species recognition. And so when you're watching dragonflies, it's almost like watching little birds. And they have territories like birds and, and a number of other features that makes them very attractive for people mm. who like birds too. <laughs> but that was the first dragonfly I'd ever drawn, and maybe the last. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you for drawing a dragonfly. <laughs> okay, the next one is, um, the title is Song of Silence, and it is a, I forget what that it's is. It's a white-footed mouse. White-footed mouse, mm -hmm. yeah. And then I'm going to skip to the lightning bug. <clears throat> and this one is um, a new drawing that he um, drew for the book, and you can tell the story on that one. <laughs> okay, lightning bugs. What better show for mortals, bursting with rivers of free light, playing out above the darkened grass? 
Night opens the blue folds of its silk. Like stars blinking, they row awake, countless beetles, their abdomens brimming with luminescence, out from under snags and black leaves into the brief and cinnamon air. Over pond and blade, in their appetite, they bring us fire, restoring a spark of salvation to our cr crumpled lives, these mysterious gatherers, these silent signalers, these copious lightning bugs of childhood delight. Yeah, well, I wasn't very excited about drawing a lightning bug. I, <laughs> I, I looked at some specimens, they're little brown things about that long. Uh, my God, <laughs> what can I do with that? And so when I drew it, I drew it as if it were just standing on a, on a piece of grass during the day and it didn't do much. Then I thought, well, maybe it'll be more interesting if I make it night. So I started stippling and stippling and stippling and finally came to what looked sort of like a night scene. And then it got better. Uh, <laughs> but in fact, I guess it's one of the better drawings in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a much different drawing, I think, of a lightning bug than you normally see. Mm -hmm. I like it. I like that eye a lot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, and next is um, Eastern Screech Owl, and I wasn't going to read that poem. Did oh, you want to say? Can I say just a little bit yes, about it? Yes, I, I, I uh, did a book on uh, owls of North America back in the 80s and uh, drew it at that time. It's a pair of screech owls basically courting. Uh, both male and female will preen the other bird, especially around the head parts they can't get at themselves, and that was about the time my son Scott got married and wanted to use it as a, as a wedding announcement. So it served that purpose. <laughs> now it's served yet another purpose. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, I like that pair of vowels. I think they're charming. Okay, the next one is called Walk on the Prairie. And this is the drawing for it is grass. It's a, it's a prairie book. We need grass, you know. And um, I'll let you tell the story on how you find those grasses. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. It's called Walk on the Prairie. There is mystery here in the shapes of grass, in the dim movements of an inland sea, connections to an earlier time. Wonder barefoot, hypothesize the dance of millennia, the unbearable carvings of the built environment, this ragtag escape. Let its divine simplicity ooze into your pores. Comb the steel from your hair. Blanket your tongue with orange. Your breathing will slow. Breathing slow, unbutton the child within. Give her permission to go fly a kite. Well, I decided we should have the four basic tall grass prairie species, the ones that are the dominance, as it were, out on the prairie, Indian grass, switchgrass, big blue stem, little blue stem. But when you came around, I think it was probably November, December, <laughs> all, all the grasses were not only dead, they were falling apart. <laughs> so it was very hard to find any specimens that still had all of the individual florists. But, uh, uh, but eventually I did, and so uh, that's how I came up with that particular drawing. But it was one of the harder ones. Grasses are hard hard to make interesting, I guess. They don't have expressions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, the next one is called Grasshopper. And the drawing. That, uh, that was one I drew for my Sand Hills book. The species of grass is, is sand drop seed, and it occurs in this area, but not very commonly, but uh, I had already drawn it, and the grasshoppers I drew were ones that occur here. Uh, one, of the, one of them refers, the two top ones are courting, the male is the one lifting his hind legs off on the left, and then there's another one just as a boy you're watching what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought it was a cute drawing, so we decided to use it. All right. <laughs> The next one is um, Upland Sandpiper. Did you want to say something uh, about yeah, Upland, Upland Sandpipers? Sand Upland Sandpipers are one of the truly, uh, uh, I suppose, land uh, trademark, if you will, 
uh, birds of the tall grass prairie. At one time, they extended east all the way to at least New York State. I used to see them in New York State. But they do require quite a bit of prairie. About 200 or so acres is needed to support a pair of upland sandpipers. And we have a few pairs out at Spring Creek, so I thought it would be nice to, to have it. I had drawn that drawing uh, for uh, a, my book on the sand hills, and I originally had it landing on an upside down boot. You've all been to the sand hills, and you all know how uh, old boots are put upside down on fence posts. Well, there aren't any boots like that out at Spring Creek Prairie, so I had to redraw the bottom half and make it an ordinary fence post. But the, the lovely thing about upland sandpipers is when they land, and they're the only only sandpiper that one nests well away from water and two likes to perch on top of, of uh, posts and small trees and such. And when they do land in a place like that, they hold their head, or hold their wings over their head for a few seconds in a very sort of balletic way, very graceful way. So that was what I was showing there. Hmm. That's nice. Okay. Let's see. Next one is Monarch. And this is a new drawing. Um, this is one of my favorite ones that you drew. Um, I'll read the poem and then you can comment here. Monarch. Look there over the white caps of inland summer, a flutter of bright wings toward a nectar profusion, fountains of wildflowers delivering, their pink, yellow, purple bounties splayed under the sun for the awakened proboscis, the monarch on his fleeting seasonal flights. Who would think of danger, orange-black beauty, bundled and poisonous to its feathered enemy? Oh, to ride the air on such royal wings through this temperate life with such little fear. Mm. You all know, probably, a couple of things are implied here. One is that the larval monarch butterfly feeds on milkweed, the leaves of milkweed, which is very high in poisonous alkaloids. And it's one of the few insects uh, that can not only eat but, but grow on this. It's all they eat. And so it stores those alkaloids in its body and keeps them as it transforms into an adult uh, animal. And also monarchs are very strong flying and even today, you could probably see monarchs headed south. They, uh, they migrate all the way to Mexico. Uh, it takes several generations in the course of a year for them to get from Mexico up to this area or beyond and then back again. But it's an incredible migration. Somehow they know within those tiny brains exactly where to go, end up in the same valley in central Mexico. So I, I show on this drawing a, a monarch that's just now emerged from its chrysalis below, it's the sort of empty remains of the chrysalis, and then another one that's about to come out. So uh, it, it was a, a difficult drawing, but a, a lot of fun to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that turned out nice. Okay, so um, next one is um, called Summer Night, Day, Night, um, and it's a Yellow-headed blackbird. blackbird. Um, cicada is the next one. And this is a new drawing. I wasn't going to read that one. I, I think we need um, to be... Let me say a little say, bit about cicadas. Yeah, okay. Cicadas are very interesting. They spend, I suppose, 95 or more percent of their life underground. That's one interesting thing. They spend anywhere from a few, well, a year to as many as uh, about 15 years underground in a larval state till they finally emerge, uh, crawl up as the last step of their, their larval stage, and, and then molt and leave their, the, ec the exoskeleton of their, their larval form behind, empty, and, and emerge then as full-winged adults. And then within a few weeks, they, they have bred and, uh, and die. Uh, we had a, an emergence of the 15-year cicada, oh, maybe five, six years ago, not around Lincoln. You had to go over to, oh, up almost to the river, the Missouri River, to see them. Uh, they're rather localized in Chicago. I was in Chicago last week, and they had an emergence of a 15-year cicada mm -hmm. earlier this summer. Uh, 
why the insect spends that much time uh, is something of a mystery, but the interesting thing is that beyond the, those annual cicadas, which come out every year, the others come out in years that represent prime numbers like 3, 7, 13, 15, and cool. they, they're not mathematicians, but apparently selection has allowed them to stagger their life cycles in such a way that no predator can easily time his or her its own reproduction because the, the timing is so long, no other species really can afford to wait that long for, a, for an enormous feast to come along. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. I always learn something when you say, when you're talking. Um, the next one is the great blue heron. It's a lovely drawing that goes with this. Um, I'll, I'll read this one. Uh, this might be one of the more environmental poems I have in here, although I kind of think they all have a, an environmental bent to them. Great Blue Heron. At twilight, it rises off the polished mirror pond. On cupped wings moves gray and steady above the ripples of grassland, circling only to circle back. All day, it stalks the dark shadows for a meal. All this orange season on stick legs, trolls to survive, sporting its feather necklace, its backward head plume. Often we are strangers on, to earth, stumbling over the thorns of our days. Here, sky sets fire to the silk sleeves of its clouds. If you love this planet, stand at attention. Take only what you need, only what is rightfully yours. Uh, the heron, great blue heron, is, is probably our largest wading bird. It's relatively common. There's a breeding colony at the south end of, uh, of Wilderness Park, so if you want to watch herons at the nest, uh, uh, there's a colony of about maybe a dozen or so nests down there. They, they spread out along, the, uh, along Salt Creek and feed in, in the water on frogs and minnows, whatever they can catch. So it's, it's a big, spectacular bird. And a lot of people confuse them with cranes. Oftentimes they'll tell me, people will say, oh, I saw a sandhill crane uh, wading in Salt Creek or something like that. Yeah. It's always a great blue heron. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Um, the next one is called Prairie Giants in the Earth. And the drawing is of a prairie sage word, I think. And the next one is a red-tailed hawk. <clears throat> have to have a red-tailed hawk for the prairie. And the next one is called Late Fall, and it is a drawing. Tree sparrow. Tree sparrow, OK. And I will read this one, called Late Fall. All night, in a stiff north wind, the tall grass hunkers down into dew. Insect, mammal, bird without you, holds its own near root and crown, breathes as one beneath a bowl of stars. Now the late rising light scatters as you walk, reveals blanched stalks, orange tan, red-headed sumac, the touch-and-go tumble of seed heads. The erratic wet rock in the sun shines red. The heart among such riches leaps. That's a... Uh American tree sparrows are winter visitors here. They, they haven't arrived yet, but by November they should be arriving. They spend the winter here, then they, they head north, of course, and so the bird I drew is literally hunkered down, fluffing out its feathers to keep warm. It's on a willow twig. And again, I had drawn that for some other purpose, but it seemed to fit pretty well here. Hmm. Okay. All right. And I'll just read a couple more. And um, the next one is Bobcat. I want to read that one. I read this down at Peru State College, and they loved it. <laughs> <laughs> They're the Bobcats, yeah. OK. <laughs> Bobcat. Out of necessity, each wild understone guards its secrets, preserves its sanctity far from the weight of unforgiving pavement. To think, out here in the shadowy crevice or hollow it thrives, 
emerges solitary under the nocturnal dance of stars, with luck and patience handed down from its predecessors, undoes the inner life of a small mammal, a bird, perhaps, this tawny relative of our lazy house pet invoking the feral, while we gaze from our doorstep into ink at silent dippers, to think there might be something out there breathing on the edge, bringing a chill, all instinct and tooth, tribute to claw and fur. Uh, there are bobcats at Spring Creek. I don't know if you've seen them. But I have There's seen been them. a kind of a resident bobcat hanging around uh, cool. the center, at least all through last winter. I haven't seen it. Bobcats are hard to see, but uh, I don't know whether you knew that there were bobcats out there when you wrote this. or. or I knew. I thought there were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're that. pretty much everywhere. They're in every county. and. They're doing pretty well. Uh, I drew that one from a, uh, a hand-reared bobcat that had been, uh, I think, abandoned by its parent, or maybe its parent had been killed, I'm not sure. But in any case, it was about four months old when I drew it. And I, it made, to my mind, it's one of the better drawings in the book. Hmm. OK. And I will end with the last poem of the book, but it's not Northern Harrier, which is the next one. And um, Northern Harrier, that's a bird that used to be called the marsh hawk. It, marsh it hawk. hangs out near marshes. It, it nests around the edges of marshes. And uh, it's a mouse. It's a mouse-eating hawk, if you will. 95, 99 percent of what it eats are small field mice. So it's a very useful from, not from the mouse's standpoint, but from our standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I will end. And I think you have something to read, yeah. if, if we have time, yeah, time for him to read something at the end. Um, and the, the last poem in the book is um, paired with a short-eared owl feather. And it's called, This Fragile Healing Land. How fragile this land is and how healing that we might gather its bounty, be humbled by its opulent and sufficient nourishment. If we could only learn to inhale its pale breath, abandon ourselves to its fragmented song. See there, water, leaf, and feather, ribbons in the wind, the sun a copper disc at sunset. Let the wheel of your singular mind unwind. Imprint your body with each phase of the moon. Be open to the unexpected. Expect to be amazed. I think you told me you stole my title from this fragile land. <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> <That's Worked. all laughs> <right. laughs> um, I thought I'd read a few things from maybe a couple of different books. Uh, a collection of my writings was put together a few years ago by the uh, Great Plains Art Center in conjunction with a uh, an art exhibit that I did with Mike Forsberg. And uh, uh, some of the ones that have clear relationships to prairie, I thought I might read in the time allowed. Let me start with prairie chicken, because I mentioned specifically that uh, as a favorite bird of mine. Prairie chicken lack. This is from Grassland Grouse and Their Conservation, a book that I wrote about uh, the six or seven species of grouse that live in, in grasslands. We have far too few sacred natural sites in the eastern Great Plains. Most of the holy sites of the Native Americans that once ruled the plains have long since been cleared and, quote, developed, or their exact locations have been long forgotten. But we must not forget the locations of prairie chicken leks. They whisper to us of secret places where grama grasses and blue stems grow thick on the ground and where flint arrowheads are likely to be buried beneath the thatch and lust. They tell us of meadowlark and dick sissel song perches and of traditional coyote hunting grounds. They are as much a connection to our past as are the ruts left in the soil by Conestoga wagons or the preserved costumes of Native American cultures carefully stored in museums. Another, uh, another quote from the same book. It's called uh, The Vital Essence of Life. 
Prairie chickens are the vital essence of the land, clinging to their brief moments in the sun with all the energies they can muster. They risk attack by early rising hawks and late flying owls simply to have a chance to reproduce before they are all too quickly cut down by predators, disease, or a hunter's gun. The feathers that they wear and that are sometimes strewn over the ground when a predator has been successful uh, and are the camouflage colors of dead grass, and their soft hypnotic voices are exciting yet soothing, like the mantras emanating from a Hindu temple. They comprise a New World symphony all by themselves, a harmony of sound, color, and movement. Uh, something about Nebraska from uh, the nature of Nebraska. There's a place in America where the East and the West merge together as smoothly as one river flows into another. There's a river in America that gave sustenance to perhaps 100,000 immigrants who trudged westward in the mid-19th century along the Mormon and Oregon trails. That river is called the Platte. There's a vast region of sandy grasslands in America that represents the largest area of dunes and the grandest and least disturbed region of tall grass prairies to be found in all the Western Hemisphere. That region is called the Sand Hills. There's an underground reservoir in Nebraska that at its maximum may be close to 1,000 feet deep and provides the largest known source of unpolluted water to be found anywhere. That reservoir is called the Oglala Aquifer. There's a state in America that offers un unhindered vistas of the West, stores vast fossil deposits that shed light on our collective past, and boasts an, en an enlightened citizenry that has built an enviable human history and looks confidently toward the future. That state is called Nebraska. Another from the same book. There are still places in Nebraska where one can lie back on a fragrant bed of last year's blue stem in early April with the half intoxicating odor of freshly germinating grass invading one's nose and the shrill but majestic music of cranes almost constantly overhead with occasional harmonies added by arctic bound if nearly invisible geese. There is then a true sense of belonging to and being part of the land and one can only give an unspoken prayer that such treasures will still be there for those of the next generation to savor and love. At such times, one will realize that, although there may be places with higher mountains than Nebraska, with magnificent rock-bound coastlines or misty cloud forests, it really doesn't matter. This is our spiritual home, our own self-chosen nirvana, our prairie-born paradise, the natural surviving legacy of long forgotten winds, immense amounts of water, now vanished glacial ice, and unfathomable eons of time, it has been freely bestowed upon us either to keep or to destroy. May we choose to keep it. Maybe one last, if there's time, one last poem. I began to realize that the true heart and spirit of Nebraska is not to be found in our eastern cities, our vastly overrated athletic programs, or even, couldn't resist that, I do that in every book, <laughs> or even in our historic and now dying Platte River that whispers sad dirges to times past as it glides eastward to meet an equally altered and degraded river. Rather, the state's pioneer spirit still persists in the quiet recesses of the Sand Hills, particularly in the fortitude of the people who once homesteaded there and whose descendants sometimes still live there. That was from this fragile land. We have time about a minute or more or so. This is the one I actually intended to read. Skeins of snow geese can still etch a March Nebraska sky from dawn to dusk prairie chickens still annually greet the spring sunrises with their ancestral rituals, and the spine-tingling cries of sandhill cranes coming to roost on the plat still bring with them the distant echoes of thundering bison, trumpeting mammoths, and of times before recorded time. 
we can still totally lose ourselves in their grace and beauty, imagining that we have discovered some other Eden and hopefully resolve to act in such a way that these birds might still be able to cast their marvelous spells just as strongly on our descendants a century hence, hence as they do today. I think that's it. Thank you very much.